These chemicals yeah. can directly impact the diversity and function of the microbiome. The hormonal control of eating behaviors, they affect thyroid function, which is directly linked to metabolism. I li literally had a patient <clears throat> this week who uh, was a 55 year old woman who had struggled with weight her whole life um, after getting pregnant. And she tried everything and has been to every doctor, seen every specialist, and nobody's found anything. And she said, I eat healthy, I eat great, I don't I exercise, like what the heck is going on here? And th there's a phenomenon that I've seen over and over in decades of practice, which is this phenomenon of resistance to weight loss, where people do all the right things, they exercise, they eat great, they sleep, they, they deal with their stress, they take the right supplements, and just the weight just does not come off. And it, it's something I've had to really investigate. And and I have written a bunch of pieces about it, about all like the eight reasons you can't lose weight other than your diet, basically, and lifestyle. So I think we're going to dive deep into this topic today and, and look at the things that are beyond exercise, beyond diet, beyond sleep, um, beyond stress management. So what are, what are the levers of metabolism that go beyond that? What are the things that you found that are the real factors that are driving problems with people's metabolism that have nothing to do with lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, that that patient example you just gave really hits home because I think we've all had that type of patient who is really doing everything right and not seeing the progress that they want. And so this really inspired me to dig deeper into what does the research say about what other factors might be involved in improving our metabolism, uh, our weight, our overall health, our longevity that aren't just the main one we, ones we talk about, which are food, sleep, stress management, and exercise. And there are really three additional factors that seem to really have strong research backing that impact metabolic health in a big way that yeah. you're probably not going to hear about from your doctor. And these three are one, how much exposure we're getting to sunlight and at what times of the day we're getting it. The second one is the amount and types of metabolism disrupting environmental chemicals we're exposed to. And these now have a special name of this category of metabolism disrupting chemicals called obesogens because they actually promote obesity. And the third, um, and this one does relate to food, but it's a little bit more specific, is the levels of specific micronutrients in the body that we know are critical for metabolic processes to run properly in our cells. So we often sort of stop the conversation at food around macronutrients, how much protein, fat, um, carbohydrates are in our food, but really shifting the conversation towards specific micronutrients, these vitamins, minerals, cofactors, antioxidants in our food is another level of the dietary conversation that I think often uh, gets missed. So, so those are really three that I think are strong that can accelerate or enhance that that journey of weight loss, of metabolism optimization, optimization, of improving insulin resistance for many people who are feeling stuck. Mm. Yeah, and I and I would. Can I add a few more? Please, yes. Because <laughs> I Let's thought about this a there. lot. In yeah. fact, in fact, you know, uh, Casey, in my first book ultra, uh, on metabolism, ultra metabolism, in two thousand and five, I wrote one of the chapters was "Love Your Liver." <laughs> <laughs> yes. And and it was really about the role of toxins and the load of toxins causing obesity in ways that really had not really imagined before. And the data since I wrote that book in 2005 has just been overwhelming about its effect on uh, all sorts of things from insulin resistance. So BPA, for example, which is uh, what you get on credit card receipts, it's in plastic bottles, cans, that causes insulin resistance. And, and that's just one example. So there's a whole slew of those things. And, but there's more. For example, the microbiome turns out plays a huge role in our metabolism, independent of what we eat. And they've done studies on mice and and an animal, little rats or whatever they <laughs> do the studies on. And they 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 found that uh, just swapping out, for example, a poop from a thin mouse to a overweight mouse causes that mouse to lose weight, uh, independent of their dietary intake. So the microbiome is huge. Also hormones, uh, and a lot of things go on around hormones, uh, thyroid hormones, um, sex hormones, obviously insulin, which is hugely involved in diet, but that can be involved in many other things that are independent of diet. And uh, also um, 
food sensitivities, I think, are one that people don't often realize. That anything that causes inflammation, independent of calories, can cause a problem. So if you're eating something you think is healthy, but actually your body's creating an immune response, that's going to create inflammation, and that's going to cause insulin resistance. Uh, and then there's also other phenomena that might happen, like mitochondrial disorders that are more uncommon, or other factors. So I've, I've looked at so many different things over the years that are driving and resistance to weight loss. And usually if you're a good detective and you kind of drill down, you can really uh, get to the bottom of it for most people. And it's, you know, and, and uh, the obesogen thing is really true. I, I had a patient who was this trainer. She was like a fitness trainer, super healthy, ate great, and she just could not lose weight. And we did a deep dive and we found that she had really high levels of mercury. We got rid of the mercury and she dropped 40 pounds like that. It was pretty amazing. So it's, uh, it's super powerful. Absolutely. And I think you really get at a key point here, which is that there are so many factors that are involved in what's happening with our metabolism, our cell biology, and you really need to dig deep and ask those questions and have time with the patient or the patient needs to have this baseline understanding to even under, to even go down that road of identifying what is going on and what are the potential barriers to actually having the health that we want. And this is where, of course, functional medicine absolutely shines because we tend to have a little bit more time with the patients and actually are going down all of these different pathways that actually lead to the reality of our cellular physiology in the body. And so um, I think from that perspective, from these, you know, at this point, I think we probably named 10 things that are related to insulin sensitivity and metabolism. And, you know, really it comes down to being a detective, like you said, and figuring out in your life, in your body, which are the factors that are at play? What are the barriers? to improving them and how do we do it? And so it's, I think knowing these things can really help um, just a sense of uh, hopefulness because there's there's probably several avenues that any person has not dug into before they're kind of at the end of the road in terms of getting their health on track. For sure. So so uh, Casey, let's dig into the toxins. Um, and, and first, uh, uh, I want to talk about how much we learned in medical school about this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which zero. Zero. Like, okay. Like we learned about <laughs> acute poisoning, but we never learned about the low. I mean, it's, honestly, the, the two things that were the three things that we really need to know about our health, like our microbiome, toxins, and food, we know nothing about in medical school. So it's, Not uh, it's insane. But th these are the areas that have the most leverage in getting people healthy. So uh, in terms of um, the framework around obesogens, what, what are the ones we should be most worried about when it comes to metabolism? And then we'll get into... Um, how we diagnose problems with that, and actually how 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 the mechanism of these toxins uh, influences our metabolism. Yes. So, like you said, obesogens are toxins, and obesogens, as you can tell from the name, it it has to do with fat and obesity. And so, the real landmark um, thing that's kind of happened recently is we've realized that. Obesogens are specific metabolism disrupting chemicals in the environment that it directly increase fat mass. So this is not uh, a correlation. This is causation. And there was this great paper that came out earlier this year. It was 49 pages. It was a tome. And Dr. Dr. Rob Lustig was one of the authors. And it uh, was called Obesity 2. And it was all about obesogens. And it concluded mm, that wow. these chemicals we now know directly increase fat mass through about a dozen different mechanisms. Yeah. And it is thought that potentially 15% of obesity is directly attributable to these chemicals chemical exposures. Wow. So where are they from? Um, they are basically all around us. They are in the air we breathe. They are in the food we eat. They are on the food we eat. They are in our cosmetics and our personal care products, our home care products. They're in our furniture, our electronics, papers. Uh, they are all over the place. And actually, a few come from natural origins like lead and, and cadmium, and you mentioned mercury, but most are industrially manufactured chemicals that are largely unregulated. And so some of the specific examples of where you can find these. So uh, well, mercury is natural, but it doesn't mean it's healthy, right? <laughs> lead and mercury are natural, exactly. but they're healthy. <laughs> And there are there is that handful of natural um, obesogens like the mercury and the cadmium um, and the lead that can in increase fat mass, but you you know you want to be conscious of how much of this you're consuming. But the vast majority of these are coming out of factories, coming out of companies that have huge lobbying power and that are putting these in everything. And so this is things like 
can linings, thermal papers, uh, toner, printer toner, vinyl floorings. They are in basically all plastics, even wow. if the plastic is BPA free. Uh, they're found in our personal care products, especially shampoos, conditioners, lotions, wow. deodorants, sunscreens, makeups, food preservatives, food colorings. They're actually in drugs. Um, antidepressants have been known to have obesogenic properties. They're in car exhaust, so it gets in our air, paint that goes on our walls, our clothing. They're in flame retardants on children's toys, on mattresses, on couches, um, a lot of different home care products like disinfectants. And then, of course, one that is on everything, which is agricultural pesticides. So all of these things that I just mentioned have been shown to have mechanistic properties that increase fat, basically the printing of fat in our bodies. <laughs> so um, so this is kind of fascinating. And, and the mechanisms are, it's not just one thing. They really all work together synergistically to cause metabolic problems. And some of the big ones touch on one you were talking about earlier today, which is microbiome. So these chemicals yeah. can directly impact our microbiome, the diversity um, and function of the microbiome. These chemicals can alter the hormonal control of eating behavior. So actually affecting our satiety hormones and our hunger hormones. They affect thyroid function, which is directly linked to metabolism. They uh, impact sirtuin genes, which are, of course, as Dr. Sinclair has popularized, these are um, very important for our longevity. They change the folding of our genome. So actually our epigenetics and the way genes are expressed, they can directly cause gene mutations. They cause inflammation. And then they can really affect um, our hormone receptors. So this is a big one. They can either be activators of hormone receptors or blockers of hormone receptors. And of course, hormones are so, so critical. This nuanced balance of our, of our health and our day-to-day -day functioning. And these chemicals can literally go in and, and block or activate those receptors. One frightening thing I'll just mention is that they not only affect all these things in our bodies, but they also do it to our sex cells. So our germ cells, like our sperm and eggs, which means that the, the impact of these chemicals that are all over our environment uh, can affect our offspring through germ cell, which is essentially our, our, our sperm or eggs, um, epigenetics and uh, DNA. So we really need to all be familiar with the term obesogen, understand where they come from and understand how to advocate both for ourselves and on a systems level to minimize the exposure that we're getting to these in our environment. Yeah, and many huge. of them last for generations. So, yeah. Like you were saying, yeah, I mean, just thinking about how, for example, <laughs> leptin is, you know, you get leptin resistance with increased environmental toxins. You get, uh, which makes you feel like you're, you're hungry all the time and you get effects on your mitochondria, which helps affect your metabolism and how fast your metabolism works. So there's so many different mechanisms uh, that are underlying this. And I think we're now beginning to understand this. And we also see how they trigger inflammation. So any, any toxins, they're also immunotoxins. So they increase uh, this this process of making more inflammatory cytokines through this mechanism called NF-kappa B. And you get high levels of these cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukin-6. Um, it, it's so central to everything. So this sort of sort of inflammation from any cause will cause weight gain and obesity. And and it, and then the, here's a problem that's even worse. When people start to lose weight, guess where all the toxins are stored? They're stored in our fat tissue. So when you start to liberate fat tissue, you start to liberate more toxins. And actually, there's a phenomenon of resistance to weight loss as you're as you're losing weight. You're going to actually. Uh, stop losing weight because the toxins interfere with the very process of weight loss. They affect your thyroid function and many other things. So it's a little bit of a mess. So you have to really help people detoxify properly and learn how to get their systems working. And that's, that's kind of, uh, what's so great about functional medicine. And I, you know, I, I wrote an article, I uh, guess it was, God, I don't know when it was, God, it was probably forever ago. Uh, it was, it was, it was called systems biology, um, systems biology, toxins, obesity, and functional medicine. And it was, uh, I think, gosh, in the probably early 2000s. And it was really just looking back then at the data that we had on this. And now, like you said, there's so much more data. Um, 
and we're so exposed to to toxins and they're really pretty much everywhere <laughs> so it's it's a it's a little discouraging for people because like what do you do and how do you start to think about this so you have these toxins so uh people listening are going, okay well gosh you know, we live in a sea of toxins this is pretty depressing i if i eat like you know straw i'm still gonna you know gain weight so what do i what do i do <laughs> what do i do like how do we avoid them how do we get them out, what do, what do we do to help address this sort of phenomena of obesogens in our in our in our environment? This is the key question, and I think, you know, I think it's a battle that's going to be fought on many different axes. Um, and I say battle because it really is an uphill um, battle against industry that uses these chemicals and wants them in a lot of different things. And um, you know, of course, aren't necessarily top priority is not necessarily our health. So I think there's I think there's really four main axes that we're going to need to approach this on and one is on the systems level, um one is on the individual choice level. So we can of course advocate through our vote and our dollar about what happens at the systems level, but then of course day to day we also just have to choose like what we're putting in on and around our body. Then the second the, the other two axes really is focusing on personal avoidance but also improving biologic resilience. So how do we actually build a body that processes these chemicals effectively, detoxifies them, gets them out, and is healthy enough at baseline that we can manage this additional stress, which unfortunately is almost inevitable. So I think just briefly touching on that systems level, um, which you know you have written about in such detail, and I, you know, Food Fix gets into this a lot, and so I'll just you know very, very um, briefly touch on this one. You know, I think it's it's a crazy statistic, but our rate of global chem- chemical production is increasing at a rate of almost four percent a year, and will probably double by twenty thirty. And since just the year two thousand, deaths from just ambient air pollution. Uh, linked to fossil fuels and chemical pollution has risen by almost 70%. And very little regulation has come from this. Um, We have a law that's meant to protect us, which is called the Toxic Substances Control Act, but which um, came out in the 1970s, but has really been poorly, poorly implemented. And we see things happening all the time where strong science comes out like, um, Recently, the EPA put forward a proposal to get rid of a chemical called trichloroethylene, which is used in um, dry cleaning and removing grease from different things like clothing or car parts or bikes or things like that. And the proposal to ban this was strongly supported by science and was just completely basically rejected and withdrawn because of strong complaints and lobbying from the chemical industry. So it's it's so that so the systems level, we can think about using our dollar um, and advocating for, um, you know, for legislation that helps. But really, it comes down to, you know, acutely what we're doing on a day to day basis. So there's definitely some easy practical tips that we can do to to kind of help ourselves. I think the first one is eat real, clean, sustainable, uh, sustainably grown food. You know, this is the basic building block of the body for improving biologic resilience. And if you're eating whole foods that are grown in a clean, sustainable way, you're getting a lot of the way there. It means that you're getting the micronutrients that are going to help your body um, process these chemicals. It means that you're getting the uh, the different plant chemicals that are going to upregulate our antioxidant defenses and our anti-inflammatory pathways. It means that we're going to be avoiding pesticide exposure, which is an obesogen. It means that we're not buying things that come in plastic. So just by eating, you know, fresh, whole, clean, uh, sustainably grown food, you're hitting a lot of the different boxes with the obesogen problem. Um, within whole foods, there are some that are extra special. So of course, cruciferous vegetables, which are going to have the sulforaphane that activates our antioxidant defense system. So this is the cauliflower, broccoli, kale, bok choy, cabbage, uh, sauerkraut, these things that are directly going to change gene expression to protect us from some of these obesogenic chemicals. Um, then of course it's like what's your food stored in. So we want to avoid plastic storage as much as we can and really try and opt for glass and other materials. And now it's so easy to find this stuff. You can go on Amazon, you get glass Tupperware, glass water bottles, aluminum or ceramic, things like this. Um, 
And again, it's not just about BPA. I think that's a little bit of a, we, we often now look for BPA free plastics, but, um, plastics contain as many as 15 endocrine disrupting chemicals. So BPA is just one and it's great that it doesn't have that, but there's other things like BPF and BPS and these other chemicals that we know are endocrine disruptors. So, um, be the weirdo who brings, you know, the bamboo fork and knife in your purse to the takeout restaurant, get, you know, be the person who always has the glass water bottle and who has the brings your own storage containers because these things actually do add up and make a difference. Um, the next the category <laughs> that is really important, be the weirdo, be the weirdo. I mean, I, you know, and, and the, and, you know, give these things as gifts. I, I have a, a running Google doc of, of gift ideas and a lot of them are becoming basically these types of things, like give people the portable reusable wood cutlery, you know, and things like this that they might not think about, but that can really um, help their health. Um, I am someone who loves personal care products. I love cosmetics and, you know, all this stuff. And so this one has been really important to me figuring out how to basically reduce the toxin, toxins and toxic load of all these products I'm using. Um, and so I think this is really low hanging fruit. So basically look at your bathroom, look at your shampoos, conditioners, lotions, makeup, deodorant, toothpaste, and probably throw out most of what's in there and look for the brands that have very few ingredients that are ingredients that you recognize and know and that are approved ideally by the Environmental Working Group website, which has a basically a registry of all personal care products. And you can just walk through the store and search things on your phone and find out what is least likely to be toxic. So I've really moved away from a lot of the the complex products to things like for moisturizer, like you can use organic coconut oil or jojoba oil. You can use cast style soap like Dr. Bronner's for dish soap, for hand soap, for body soap. You can use vinegar and water for disinfecting, disinfecting sprays for your countertops. Like it's actually, once you get on this train, it's quite, quite easy. And hard. there's yeah, so many great hard. brands these days. It's not that hard. Yeah. It's super important. And, uh, and then of course you need to give your body the things to detoxify, right? Right. And that, and actually supplements can be helpful in that regard. Whole food, of course, is the foundation, but supplements like vitamin C, curcumin, probiotics, resveratrol, vitamin E, these have all been shown to have, um, basically, uh, resilience boosting effects on our ability to process toxic chemicals. And I think the last one I would mention, I mean, we could go on and on forever about how to avoid these, but I think another important one is air filtration because air pollution is is such an underrecognized um, contributor of chronic disease. And so getting a really high quality air filtration system actually has been studied and has been shown to have a clinical effect on mitigating the effects of, of toxic air pollution. So really personal care products, whole foods, making sure you're including cruciferous vegetables and anti-inflammatory foods, avoiding plastics, um, and getting your air under control and, and maybe supplementing with some high yield supplements. Those are definitely some of the things that we can do that are pretty simple, um, to avoid our, to, to avoid the impact, uh, the mega impact of these chemicals. Yeah. So you don't be too depressed because there's a lot of things you can do to reduce your exposures, yeah. to upregulate your own detox pathways. Uh, things like saunas are great, very good for detoxing chemicals, making sure you're eating a lot of fiber, which helps you eliminate the chemicals. And sometimes you need a you know, more aggressive detox protocol with the doctor, but it can be a very effective strategy for people. Uh, to help them lose weight. So let's, let's sort of jump to the next topic because the toxins are a bit depressing. <laughs> they <laughs> are, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I just, I just, before we jump off of that topic, I, I saw a report recently which sort of shocked me. Uh, you know, it was, and we know about 11 million people die every year from eating bad food, not enough of the good foods, which I think is probably an underestimate. Uh, but there's about 9 million people that die every year from the environmental toxins in the environment. So it's a huge cause of global deaths, which makes it really high up there. I mean, there's about 70 million, I think, deaths every year, but uh, about, I think, 9 million are from toxins. And those are something we just don't know anything about from a perspective of traditional medicine. But thank God functional medicine provides a way for you to assess and treat those, those, those problems. So, um, it is a real, it is a real problem. We should definitely all be focused on it and we can, shift the market by changing what we buy and what we purchase and what the demand is. So that'll also help. Um, so Casey, let's talk about the next topic, which is micronutrients. And I think it might be surprising for people to think that vitamins and minerals and micronutrients play a role in resistance to weight loss. How, how does that, how's that? So, so this is one of my 
favorite topics in health. I think in part because I don't think I learned about the idea that these micronutrients are so useful for health until way after medical school. It was really in my functional medicine training that I even, you know, got, I, I, you probably remember this, but there was this whole dogma in medical school that like, oh, vitamins and minerals just make expensive urine. And of course, now we realize like, wait a minute, like, what are these, you know, what are these actually doing it? That, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And, and so I, <laughs> well, I, well, I just said quick, quick on that, Casey, I hate to interrupt, but just, <laughs> yeah. I always say, I say on that theory, then we shouldn't drink water because we just drink water and then we pee. So we shouldn't <laughs> just drink water because it just creates a lot of excess it's discharge. We don't need. <laughs> it's, like, it's just a dumb argument. <laughs> It's so, and especially when you really actually just like turn on your brain and think about the biology of this. And so it's like, I think just breaking down briefly, like what do these micronutrients do? It makes it so obvious that that line of thinking just doesn't work. And so big picture, like our bodies are energy factories. We have all, around 37 trillion human cells in our body. Every single one has energy factories, mitochondria to basically create the energy we need to run and to function properly. And within each of those 37 trillion cells, there's probably in many of those cells, thousands or more of, of mitochondria. So we're just, I mean, the numbers are gigantic. And every single one of those mitochondria need vitamins and minerals as cofactors to allow their cellular machinery to work. And so micronutrients are this category of small molecules that we get mostly from food that are involved in these innumerable metabolic processes. And they're totally necessary for glucose re regulation and ATP production. And these include things like um, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and some that you've probably heard of um, are, of course, vitamin C, D, E, B vitamins, magnesium, selenium, chromium, there's many, many more. And they really function in three main ways. So the three ways that micronutrients function are first, they can actually be structurally incorporated into proteins to make them work properly. So an example of this is selenium. And we have this whole class of super important proteins in the body called selenoproteins. And these are critical for our immune function. And for that protein to literally be built in the cell, because all of these proteins are basically put together like Lego sets, you need that micronutrient selenium to be a part of it. And these are super important and protective antioxidant proteins. And again, really involved in immune cell function. And many, many people are deficient in Selenium. And so that's one way that micronutrients function is actually being a structural part of proteins. The second way that micronutrients function is to be a cofactor for cellular processes. And so this is like an example of this would be if you are trying to convert something in the cell, like from A to B, and it requires a protein to do that chemical reaction, that protein might need a little lock and key cofactor to basically activate it like a key in an ignition. And that is where a vitamin or a mineral can actually bind, create this tiny, tiny molecular shift in that protein that basically gets it to work properly to do that chemical reaction that might be critical for some, some step in a cellular signaling process. So the second reason micronutrients are important is because they act as these lock and key cofactors to get these cellular reactions to work properly. And then the third way that these micronutrients act is that they can directly act as antioxidants. So they not only can be a part of building proteins that become antioxidants, but they themselves can do it. And your audience is probably very familiar at this point with what antioxidants are, but really like briefly, you know, we, we make all these metabolic byproducts and all of our chemical reactions in our cells every day. And when there's an excess of these, they can be damaging, they can build up and they can hurt our mitochondria. They can hurt our DNA, other cell structures. So antioxidants actually bind to these reactive molecules and neutralize them. So these reactive molecules don't go around damaging things in the cells and things like vitamin E and vitamin A, they actually have, um, the chemical structure to bind that reactive unpaired electron on one of these reactive molecules and essentially turn it into a neutral species. Um, and literally sometimes if they have, you know, an oxygen and a hydrogen, these antioxidants, they can bind with an electron and turn it into water. And so it's truly neutralizing, damaging things in your cell. And, um, and one fun thing I learned 
you know, in my functional medicine training was that a common feature of these antioxidant molecules is that they have this hydrocarbon ring that basically has space for unpaired electrons. And so it's taking the, the, the load of this reactivity in the cell and taking them out of commission. So, so there's really three, like, very clearly understandable ways in which these micronutrients are so critical for our cells to function properly. And, and since we get them from largely food and when we don't have enough, we can get them from supplements. We can see why um, it's so important to really be eating a nutrient dense diet to load our body with as many micronutrients as, as possible. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the truth is there's so many ways in which these nutrients work. They're not just a unifunctional substance like a drug, which essentially you take and it has one mechanism of action on one receptor and it's very limited. These are multifunctional compounds, which act across all sorts of pathways in our body. And, and, and just, I just want to sort of highlight a couple of key things that I think complement what you're saying, which are around how, for example, nutrients affect metabolism. And your blood sugar and your thyroid are, are critical in terms of regulating your weight, metabolism, and your, your overall health. And ma magnesium is of critical importance in regulating blood sugar. In case you you know your company is all based on regulating blood sugar levels, health, which is quite an amazing company for measuring continuous glucose monitoring, which helps you see what's going on. But magnesium is so critical, but so is biotin and chromium, and and uh, B vitamins and a host of nutrients that we often are very insufficient or deficient in. Uh, and then thyroid is another one that's really important. For example, selenium. You mentioned selenium. That's important to convert the inactive to the active thyroid hormone. And if you don't convert it enough, you can't get enough T3, and so you're your metabolism is sluggish. Or let's say you're low in vitamin D, which is about 80% of Americans or lower, insufficient or deficient. And vitamin D is needed for the thyroid to actually work on the nuclear receptor to actually affect the gene expression that turns on your metabolism and all the other beneficial thyroid effects. So if you're low in vitamin D, you're low in selenium, if you're low in iodine, for example, another trace mineral, it's really important for producing thyroid function, thyroid hormones. So th there's so many ways that all this is connected and we really don't pay attention much to this in medicine, but it's critical to have the optimal levels of these nutrients so everything can work properly. That's exactly right. And you, so to, to following up on two things you just said, I think magnesium, which so many people are deficient is, it has like 300, uh, it, magnesium is involved, I believe in over 300 chemical reactions in the cell. And one that we never learn about is that for ATP to be biologically active in the body, it actually has to be bound to magnesium. And there's a little pocket on ATP that binds magnesium. And so, you know, what's ATP aside, for those listening who don't know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So this is sort of the end result of that mito, those mitochondrial energy producing processes that give us this currency of energy that we can use to run all our cellular processes in the body. So ATP is just so critical. It's what our body spends to basically do work and we've got to make it effectively. And to do that, we have to protect our mitochondria, which means being insulin sensitive, reducing cortisol, inflammation, oxidative stress, and really focusing on protecting our cells with all these resilience boosting um, factors that we find in whole nutrient dense clean foods. Um, and so, so yeah, so magnesium is a critical one, of course, has a huge impact on neurologic function as well. Um, and another point you touched on, which is, I think is so critical is that over half of Americans are now deficient in at least one critical micronutrient. Yeah, I think and it's 90% so, Casey, actually, according to the NHANES data. Over, <laughs> okay, so way yeah. over half then. And by the way, that's at the minimum level to prevent deficiency disease. Right. So how much vitamin C do you not, not to, need to not get scurvy? Not very much. Right. Right. And we now know that the functional need that we have for a lot of these vitamins is actually much, much higher than what is recommended to just avoid deficiency. And one interesting thing about micronutrients is that it's dynamic in our bodies. There are different days and different weeks and years that we might need different amounts of these vitamins based on what the stressors and what is being asked of our body. So for instance, if you are particularly stressed or sleep deprived and are really burning through your stress hormones, you may have a higher functional need for B vitamins that week or year to basically continue producing these things. So the idea that we need, oh, we need, you know, 1000 milligrams of vitamin C per day, like that's, that's kind of a, a crude, um, 
way of looking at it, it can actually be very, very dynamic. And for, you know, for people who may be generating more oxidative stress and need more antioxidant capacity in the body, maybe they need much more vitamin C. So I think that's another really um, important point is that these things are dynamic. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, some of them are kind of difficult to test for right now. So I think really understanding, um, you know, hopefully through podcasts like this and others that, you know, getting at least the baseline understanding of like, okay, I need a lot of micronutrients in my body. And when I'm going to the grocery store, I'm not there to buy bread and tortillas and chips. I'm on a yeah, micronutrient yeah. hunt. I am there to find as many micronutrients as possible. And I think at baseline, a really good thing for everyone to do to take ownership over some of this is to learn what the maybe 10 to 20 really important micronutrients are for key metabolic processes and where you can get some of those things. And, you know, and so that's just, that can at least help you shop, you know, to get well, those things in your this. kitchen. I yeah. love this. You know, as, as, so you and I sort of were trained in this, we go in the store, we know, right. And it's like, almost like, uh, uh what is it? Uh, that Iron Man guy, you know, he's got that, that kind of head, the goggle with the computer and you can see that like monitoring everything. So I kind of yeah. walk in and I, it's like I have this super musician on all the food and what, what's in it, what the phytochemicals are, what the nutrients are. But let, maybe we just for fun, let's just go kind of go through the nutrients and start like, and just start talking about where they are. Like, let's just start with the vitamin, vitamin A and we'll go through the list. A, B's, we'll go through the whole thing and some minerals and quickly kind of go through where people can find these things. So uh, I'm going to start like with vitamin A. Uh, vitamin A, uh, the best source, by the way, is liver. <laughs> And I was just at the farmer's market and I bought some pasture raised chicken livers and I had that for dinner with onions. It was super cheap, super delicious. Uh, that's for sure the best source, but there's also other sources. Uh, for example, a lot of the carotenoids get converted into vitamin A in the body. So sweet potatoes, carrots, uh, even green vegetables have a lot of vitamin A in them. Uh, I so love that. How about the B vitamins? Let's go through some of the B vitamins. What's their oh great source of B vitamins? We have so many, there are so many B vitamins and we basically want to get all of them in good levels. Um, and so, you know, B vitamins, you can get them from, um, from meat, from tuna, from asparagus, from Brussels sprouts, chickpeas, um, lots and lots of different, uh, sources. Do you have any favorite B vitamin sources that you I go mean, for? You know, I, I kind of the organ meat thing is gross for people, but if you actually, if you actually look at like the most nutrient dense source of B vitamins, it's liver. <laughs> <laughs> really is liver. liver. Yeah. Uh, no, no people want to eat that. So, but it, but it also is, is all in the, in the greens and, uh, a lot of animal foods have a lot of the B vitamins, B12, particularly eggs for sure. And, and, um, also, uh, it's found in, in beans and in grains. And, and so they're, they're all over the place. So, but B vitamins are relatively easy to get, although we do get a little low in folate because we don't eat enough greens. And, uh, and, uh, if you're a vegan, you're tend to be low in B12. Uh, and, so those are those, um, nutritional yeast is one, I mean, it's fortified with vitamin B12. And so that is one place for vegans to get some B12, um, that I, that I use a lot of. So let's do C and D then next. We're just going oh alphabetical order. Oh my gosh. Order. Yes. <laughs> so where can we get oh. vitamin C? <laughs> so vitamin C, I mean, not just orange about juice, because that's not what you want to do for your blood sugar, absolutely right? Absolutely <laughs> not orange juice. No, I think my favorite place to get vitamin C is bell peppers. So red peppers, orange peppers, yellow peppers. Um, you can, of course, get it from oranges and citrus fruits, um, carrots as well. Uh, but those are those are some of my favorites and certainly not from juice, uh, because you're going to get a huge dose of sugar along with that, that vitamin C. And then for vitamin D, you can get it from fish. So salmon, trout, um, and then herring. mushrooms, but herring, only mushrooms that are grown in UV light. So if you're at wow. the farmer's market, um, a lot of mushrooms now are grown indoors. And so you want to ask the farmer, like, were these grown outside or were these grown in UV light? And then of course the best place to get vitamin D is just exposing your skin to sunlight mm -hmm. outside. And so getting that yeah. UV light during the day, um, and not being quite as photophobic as we as we are these days. Yeah, for sure. And and porcini mushrooms are a great source too of vitamin D. They're harder to get. And I love going to Italy because I can get those fresh porcini mushrooms, but they're really the highest mushroom in vitamin D. Yeah. And uh and E, you know, obviously we can get from grains and beans. Uh grains that have a lot of them that the, the, they germ and the whole grain foods have have a lot of vitamin E. Um, how about, how about, uh, some of the, 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 the minerals, uh, Ooh. let's talk about some of the minerals like magnesium well, and magnesium 
yeah. is one of my favorites. Um, I am, I actually, so my favorite source of magnesium is pumpkin seeds. It is the highest amount of magnesium. I think there's 156 milligrams per one ounce serving of magnesium. So that's like what you would get in a supplementation you'd buy in the store. And zinc um, too. It's one of the really high sources of zinc. Great source of zinc, um, which is so important for our immune function. So pumpkin seeds, at least getting an ounce or so per day. I often make pumpkin seed milk in the Vitamix. I will pulse pumpkin seeds and dates in the food processor to make a crumble on top of yogurt. Um, it's really easy to get it in. You can I love them toasted on my salad. Yeah, yeah, toasted on your salad. The other great source of, of magnesium is actually chia seeds, which have mm -hmm. over 100 milligrams per one ounce serving, of course, coming along with a ton of omega-3s and fiber. Um, so chia seeds are great. You can also get a lot of magnesium from very dark chocolate, from spinach. Almonds are an amazing source. Cashews, black beans, kidney beans, tofu, um, and some animal products as well, like salmon. Um, avocado is a great source of magnesium. So it's pretty easy to get it if you're thinking about it. But I especially try and backload magnesium-rich foods at the end of the day, since magnesium can be really good for relaxation and kind of getting ready for bed. So now, now here, here's a trick question. What is the best source of most minerals? Do you know? Ooh, best source. Is it going to be liver again? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's not liver. Uh, but it, liver is good, actually, but it's not liver. It's actually something that, that uh, most people probably don't eat, but is is one of the most important foods you could eat for your health for many reasons. Uh, it helps to prevent cancer. It, it helps to uh, support your thyroid function. It's detoxifying. Any, any ideas? Ooh. You have it when you go to Japanese restaurants. <laughs> oh, like... Seaweed. Seaweed. Oh, seaweed. Okay. Seaweed. Seaweed. Nice. Seaweed is amazing. And the seaweed, iodine. And there's so many different kinds of seaweed. It's iodine, obviously, but it's full of minerals, polysaccharides for cancer prevention. So we could go on and on. But the whole point of this conversation is that is that in your grocery store is a cornucopia of both phytochemicals and vitamins and minerals. And if you know where to find them, you can find them. Like, for example, if you want selenium, uh, we talked about selenium earlier, buy Brazil nuts. Each Brazil nut has 50 micrograms of Selenium. Now, you don't want to overdose on Brazil nuts because you can get actually toxic from selenium. Uh, but, but it's, it's amazing how our food supply can be a great source of nutrients. I had, a, I had a patient once. She's like, I don't want to take any vitamins and minerals and I'm committed to getting everything I need. I'm like, okay, fine. She's like, well, I, I'm going to eat 17 pumpkin seeds and four Brazil nuts and, you know, one egg. And so she had everything sorted out and I did all the math and the spreadsheets. I mean, she must have been OCD. But it was like, yeah. I was very impressed and I was like, okay, okay. But most people are not going to be so, even I am like traveling and this and that. So I make sure I take my vitamins, but it's really important to think about thinking of your grocery store as your pharmacy. Absolutely. So that's, that, that's really a great conversation about micronutrients. We covered obesogens. Let's talk about something else, which we don't think about influencing our metabolism, which is light, sunlight. Uh, and, the, and you talk about five different ways that sunlight affects our metabolic health. Can you kind of go through that with us and talk a little bit about weight, metabolism, and light? Oh, absolutely. Yes. This one is fascinating. And, um, you know, I think that the real framework I have for this is that we think of food, and you have really, really brought this to the world, is that food is molecular information. Food is molecular information that tells our cells how to function. It tells our genes how to be expressed. It tells us what we're building our body from. But sunlight is energetic information. So food is molecular information. Sunlight is energetic information that does all those same things. It tells our body how to express our genes. It tells our body what time it is and which signaling pathways to activate. And so we've kind of got to think about it like that, like a really key input. And another really neat thing to think about is that your body doesn't really know what time it is. It doesn't really know whether it's day or night. It needs to come through our skin or our eyes to essentially tell our body what's happening. So we need to think about exposing our bodies, our eyes and our skin to this energetic information each day at the right times to have optimal biology in our body. And so that's just sort of like the framing. Um, and there's so many ways that, that sunlight impacts metabolism. The first of, of course, is impacting vitamin D production. And vitamin D has a huge impact on insulin sensitivity, glucose uptake, and overall metabolism. So vitamin D is a big one. The second reason is that 
Um, sunlight has a big impact on our serotonin activity and the way that serotonin signals in the body. And serotonin is often that neurotransmitter that we think about in relation to contentment and sort of a sense of general happiness. Um, if dopamine's more the pleasure, reward, and motivation neurotransmitter, serotonin's more the contentment and um, calm um, sort of neurotransmitter. But it also actually has a really important impact on metabolism and our desire to um, eat and our desire to pers like pursue food. And so higher serotonin levels, which we know sunlight um, can promote, can actually reduce our sort of sense of craving and hunger, um, and also stabilize mood, which has an impact therefore on our eating behaviors. So, um, so serotonin is also an interesting one. Um, there's also the impact of just sunlight on this family of genes called clock genes. So these are genes which essentially self-regulate their expression on a 24 hour cycle. Although when you expose your eyes to light impacts how those genes are expressed and downstream of a lot of these clock genes are our metabolic pathways. So, um, we, what we really want to do is get that bright light exposure first thing in the morning to tell the inside of our bodies via our eyes that it is morning. It's time to activate, you know, these pathways and set ourselves up for success throughout the rest of, of the day. Um, and then I think one other thing to just sort of touch on that I, 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 you know, I of course run this, you know, I'm, I'm one of the, the co-founders of a metabolic health company and we talk about glucose literally constantly, but I think it's fun to think about like, where does glucose come from and really trace it back. And it's, it's actually fascinating to think that the sun is really the original source of how glucose on the planet is created in many ways in that it, um, in the process of photosynthesis where, um, you know, we take carbon dioxide and water and then the sun catalyzes the production of starches and carbohydrates in the plant that we then eat that drives all these processes we talk about and that we're monitoring on our continuous glucose monitor. It all starts with the sun and it's sun energy that's in the, in the molecular bonds of, of this sort of substrate that we're, that we're talking about so much. So I just think it's also fun to back up and think about that kind of like cosmic level of like, this is really both uh, the, the sun's energy and the photon packets it literally sends to us across, you know, huge distances are not only driving our biology and our gene expression, but also driving the production of this molecule that we now, you know, talk about so much in relation to metabolic health. So there's just such an interrelationship between the sun and our metabolism. And, um, and really what the research is showing us now is that we have so separated ourselves from the natural cycles of the sun by being indoors all the time. And, and there's a, there's science term for this is irregular photic signals. So we're supposed oh, wow. to be getting bright light in the morning yeah, and no light at night. And instead we're really flipping that script. We're staying inside in the mornings. And then at night we're getting all this blue light exposure from our screens. So you can imagine for a body that has evolved for millions of years to expect one thing. And then in the past hundred years or so, it's all of a sudden getting the opposite. Well, yeah, Disease results from that, you know, that, that mismatch of the information the body's expecting and what it's actually yeah. getting. And, and one last thing I'll mention is that there's actually also papers that are talking about, um, blue light exposure as a, energetic endocrine disruptor. So we talked about obesogens as a chemical endocrine disruptor, but we need to start thinking about blue light as an actual energetic endocrine disruptor because it's changing our hormones to have this light late at night. And it's, um, it's not a small thing. So really getting back in touch with the natural cycles of when our bodies are supposed to be exposed to bright light, which is the first half of the day. And ideally within an hour of waking up and minimizing it late at night can have really, really important effects for our metabolism. Yeah. Yeah, it's so important what you're saying, Casey, because uh, you know most people don't realize that light is medicine. Yes, <laughs> right? Food is yes. medicine, but light is also medicine. And if you have the wrong light at the wrong time, it'll mess you up. And I, I'm re re researching a lot about light for my new book, Young Forever, which is coming out next 
February 23. And I was sort of shocked to see the, the amount of data on the impact of, of, um, of light on our health, uh, particularly in terms of aging, cancer, longevity, uh, all the pathways around heart disease. It's quite amazing. And I think our circadian rhythms are so important. And as doctors, we just learned that they were kind of irrelevant. You know, you just stay up all night, you work all day. <laughs> it's like, it, it was insane. I just, I think I'm still recovering from all. <laughs> all that abuse. And and the reality is that we, we now know how important it is. So there's lots of ways, like you said, early morning sunlight exposure is critical, 20 minutes, no glasses, no sunglasses, uh, and, and be outside in the bright sun if you can. Ideally, uh, blue blocker glass at night when the sun goes down, candles are great. Uh, I love it when the, uh, when the Wi-Fi goes out and the electricity goes out and we got candles in the house. It's awesome. I always feel better. I sleep better. So I think it's important to make sure we, we really understand the power of light and, and on our circadian rhythms and disturbing those rhythms is, is a big factor in, in health. And, um, and the light bulb can kind of really screw us up. I read a book years ago called Lights Out about the effect of the light bulb on our chronic disease epidemic. And it's quite, it's quite significant. It's so, so true. Um, yeah. So let, let's, uh, let's kind of talk about um, how we kind of measure our metabolism. We talked about some of the big factors that affect resistance to weight loss and metabolic health, whether it's environmental toxins and obesogens, micronutrient deficiencies, disturbances in circadian rhythm and light. We talked about the microbiome a little bit briefly and, and we talked about a, a few other things that, uh, that we don't have time to cover today. But the reality is that people who are struggling with resistance to weight loss can find a way through and they can learn how their bodies work and they can start to fix these disturbed metabolic pathways by optimizing their health. And the thing I love about you, Casey, as a doctor, is you just realized it was this big problem and you decided you wanted to do something really uh, strong to fix it. And you created a company called Levels Health, which allows people to measure their metabolic health through looking at their continuous glucose monitoring. So to talk about what that tool is, what it does, how it works, what you can learn from it, what we're seeing, and the role of, of a continuous glucose monitor in, in the management of our metabolic health. The CGM is really a revolutionary tool in that for the first time ever, we are able to track what's going on with our metabolism in real time. And we can understand in a closed loop way, how each thing that we're eating and how we're living in terms of our exercise and our sleep and our stress are affecting our metabolism in real time time. And the really cool thing is that we own this information. You're seeing it from a sensor on your body to your smartphone. You're not going through a doctor and waiting on hold for two hours to get your results of a one single snapshot, you know, test that you get once a year. It's real time data, um, that you're generating all the time. So these continuous glucose monitors are a small sensor that you wear on your body that are taking essentially a lab test, a lab measurement of your glucose, your blood sugar, every 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the sensor that you're using and sending that information to your smartphone. So you can iterate and pivot and make different decisions each day that are going to compound to improve your overall uh, glucose control, insulin resistance, and then all the downstream things that come from that. And so that's why I'm just so excited about this technology and why we started a company around it is because, you know, empowerment and understanding your own body is the name of the game in terms of how we're going to reverse this metabolic disease epidemic. So CGM is definitely one of the, the really important aspects of my health journey personally. Um, and as well as, uh, I think going to be a really powerful tool in helping with general metabolic awareness, um, that's going to hopefully drive, uh, doctors to practice differently and insurers to, to act differently. And we're going to, you know, hopefully start to see a real change in the tide of this epidemic of blood sugar problems that are now affecting over 50% of Americans. I mean, it's, it's been, honestly, I've been doing this for so long, Casey, and I'm thankful for what you're doing. Cause you know, I, <laughs> I mean, I sort of first started writing about this 20 over 20 years ago and diagnosing and treating it probably 25 more, 20 more than, I'm old anyway, a long time ago. <laughs> and it, it's just been disheartening because we just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And, uh, you know, the data just gets frightening. You know, we thought, okay, well, you know, there's maybe like 60% of people overweight now and it's 75%. It used to be 30% obese. Now it's 40, 42% of the population's obese. Now it used to be like, and then we got uh, this new data on metabolic health and 88% of Americans are in poor metabolic health. That means 12% are metabolically healthy. And then this new data came out from uh, Tufts 
What's even worse, it was like 6.8% of Americans are metabolically healthy. That, what does that mean? That means that means that 6.8% of Americans don't have high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, are not overweight, and have an out of heart attack or stroke. That means 90, I'm not going to math, 93.2% of Americans have one of those things. That's frightening to me. So now more than ever, it's important for people to get a hold of their metabolic health. And that's really why I love what you're doing. Um, and by the way, if anybody's really interested in trying out Levels, uh, you just go to levels.link forward slash Hyman, levels.link forward slash Hyman. You can learn more, sign up. And for anyone using my link, you're also going to get exclusive bonus content of Dr. Casey and I walking through our five daily longevity tactics that we're implementing in our own lives right now. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. You got a nice car. If you're actually putting good quality engine oil and a good quality calories in the case of your body, your car is going to drive a little bit longer. It's going to perform better. Okay. It's going to be happier and you're going to be happier with it for a longer period of time. If you